If you're here, you already sense there's something out there, something magical and mysterious, just waiting for you to find. And you've probably already discovered it isn't as easy as just thinking happy thoughts. You're not alone. Generations of shamans, philosophers, seers, and scientists have pursued this eternal quest. Where their ideas come together, you'll find powerful tools to cultivate magic and self-mastery in your own life. Welcome to the Magic and Mastery Podcast. I'm your host, Donna Woodwell. I'm a former journalist, an author, a master astrologer, and a hermetic initiate, and it's my honor to be your guide. In each episode, I'll meet you at the crossroads of science and spirit, reason and intuition to help you discover the wisdom that works for you. Are you ready? The adventure awaits. Hello, and welcome to this week's episode of the Magic and Mastery podcast. This is episode 20, The Shadowed Earth. Chris and I recorded this episode a few weeks ago in honor of today's eclipse, and we wanted to spend some time talking about our collective shadows. It turns out that both of us had a little less sleep than we intended the night before. So depending on how you look at it, we did an excellent job of exploring shadow because shadow has no boundaries and we wandered a lot. I think there are some rich nuggets in here to consider for your own shadowed journey. So take a listen and wait till the end when we give you an experiment that you can try out for yourself. And by the way, Don't forget to check out the episode's show notes at www.magicandmastery.com slash podcast so you can see links to some of the resources that we recommend in the show. Oh, and one more thing. We had a few problems with the audio in the first five minutes, but I promise you it'll clear up soon after that. So let's get started. I don't know about you, but it seems Every time I turn on the news, something worse is happening. And it's interesting to note that we are now in eclipse season. Now, there is a total lunar eclipse that just happened this morning here in the United States. It's a, an eclipse over the Pacific Ocean. So people on the West Coast got to see it. And it's a sunrise eclipse for me. I'm not even sure you can see this one. And then a couple of weeks from now, we've got another a solar eclipse that happens to go right over the North Pole. And since it's eclipse season, I figured it was a good time to talk about shadows. Shadows for eclipses, but also dealing with our personal shadow. But even more importantly, I think in this day and age, how we learn how to deal with our collective shadows. Now, I know I've done a couple of episodes before on shadow, shadow work, but you and I haven't had a chance to talk about it before. So, and I know you have some excellent opinions on the topic. So how would you describe shadow work? Who, me? Yes, you. (laughs) You're the only one here. I'm the only one here. Okay, maybe not, but. (laughs) Exactly. (laughs) Shadow. That's a heavy one, Donna. (laughs) That's what we're going to go into tonight. That makes sense. And so much of it can be traced back to, obviously, everything is kind of penned on the individual self. And then as we're bridging it into the collective, it's an important thing because when you have to look into your own own traumas, whether it's things that sort of happened in this lifetime or past lifetimes, that's all in the realm of shadow work. I think, you know, like the Buddhist term Shempa comes to mind, and it's very similar in the astrological community, what I find as, as Chiron it's that perpetual sort of wound that never quite heals or in, in the terms of Shempa, it's like that scratch that is always there. Like doesn't matter, really matter which stage of life you're in or how enlightened you may be. It always comes up. That wheel always turns. And that's what I equate to like also that, that sh- level of shadow and the shadow work that we actually have to go through. Um, I feel like to find that personal agency and that, that personal healing and kind of uh, embodying that um, full state of consciousness, you have to dive into the shadow. And it's not easy. It's not fun. It's sometimes you have to like pick away scabs and re-break bones so they grow stronger, things like that. So it's it's not everyone's favorite thing. But for me, it's like it feels like one of the most important work that you can be doing. 
I believe in Jungian terms, he would have defined the shadow as the parts of ourselves that we don't want to see, that we push away and either project onto other people, it's not me, it's them, or we just flat out deny even it exists, which is why I would imagine, as you say, it, it makes it so very hard to work with. I mean, how do you work with something that you are actively avoiding? I mean, how do you even get traction to begin to work with those kinds of issues? Many people go to therapists because you'd hope the therapists are holding space and maybe guiding you toward the revelation of the shadow. It's like acting as a mirror or a sounding board. I suppose some people journal. Um, I have a whole book of shadows program to teach people how to journal in order to reveal their own shadows and maintain them do that healthy maintenance work on a day-to-day basis. But, but truly, man, that's a slippery one <laughs> because even with the best behavior, yeah, you don't want to see something about yourself. Where do you go from here? Yeah, it's true. Cause there's so much shame attached to it too. You know, like when you're facing those dark territories of the consciousness, it's, it, it is uncomfortable and unsettling. And, and I think it comes like, Oh, there, uh, Carolyn Baker had this amazing book called befriending, I think befriending the dark emotions, something like that. And, uh, I think that's a, like a beautiful concept and it's, it's really about, you know, facing and accepting those shame areas of ourselves, those shadow areas of, se- of ourselves. Not just saying that we just accept and just blindly let it, you know, take, uh, take like ultimate control and just not try to heal or progress ourselves in any, in any facet, but like looking at something squarely, like uh, with, without judgment and that that's a huge thing in itself. And like, can really lead to some like powerful healing elements of just that, I'm not going to, you know, judge myself. I'm not going to shame myself, but I'm going to stare at this. I want to look at that snake in the, you know, in the face and sorry, snakes, I love you, (laughs) but you get this, (laughs) but but you know what I mean? It's like, it's, it's really, it's uncomfortable to look at that. And I think that's awesome. What you said about going to a psychiatrist or a psychologist and having that mirror, that reflection, that safe space to actually encounter those deepest, darkest parts of ourselves. And that is totally what does become illuminated during eclipse seasons. I mean, we have that whole darkening of, of, well, this is a lunar eclipse, but you can see like in that beautiful imagery, I think in a couple episodes ago, you talked about the great American eclipse that you saw. And then, you know, that shadow land kind of crossing over and and, uh, falling on the earth. And then that, you know, that beautiful brightness that comes after that darkness. And that is totally what shadow work is. It's that that veil, that dark veil sort of lowering over over the light of the mind, the light of the heart, and then that full blossoming that kind of comes after that awareness. And then that's that's powerful. Now, Chris, that was absolutely beautiful. You have me entranced by the power of shadow. Now, I suppose, could there be a bright side to shadow? That if we see everything all the time in the clear light of day, that would be a little overwhelming to our experience. I mean, don't we need some shadowy approximate areas so that we have some mystery in our experience? Just that I think we call it shadows when it becomes shadow work in the Jungian sense, when it becomes... Mm -hmm. Um, something that's a little more toxic, something that's stuck rather than something that's fertile. Does that make sense? It does make sense. And, you know, it's kind of, you know, another level of irony is that you can't have the shadow without the light. If there's no sun, there would be no shadows at all to cast them. So true. there is this, you know, this intimacy between the light and the dark and that intimate sort of, acknowledgement of the of the shadow but you're right the shadow work itself does feel like it, it's it's that layer of sort of sediment that gets kind of like attached to that psyche and to the heart and whether it's over this generation over over generations of familial karma and things like that that kind of build up psychically over time you know the 
that ripens in itself. That imagery of like that really dark, fertile soil, like that's the bedrock where, you know, that's when that whole new seeds can sprout and bloom from that. So you do need that level of dark and decay and, and, and death and everything that's taboo and shadowy and, you know, the nightmares and what have you are great sort of teachers in itself. And that's when befriending it rather than fearing it. You mentioned the concept of familial karma and, mm. and how that creates shadows, parts of our world that we don't want to see because no one in our family wants to see it. Ergo, yeah. we just don't see it ourselves because our reality is in part constructed by the people who are around us, the social construction of reality, as we've mentioned in other podcasts. Now, I bring this up because I have hope that individuals can eventually sort out how to deal with their own shadow if they want to. There are tools. Mm -hmm. You can go to therapy. You can journal. You can go see an astrologer who points it out because it's in your chart. Something. There's at least options. Oh, yeah. There's so many avenues. When you start talking about family lines mm -hmm. or the collective, what tools do we have as a society yeah. to explore collective shadow. I mean, do communities and countries and nations have shadows just the way individuals do? Or is that a nonsensical term? Uh, no, it's not. But you know, it's it's kind of funny. What was popping into my, my brain just now was there was this point of view of like the plant agenda. Um, we're talking like when we're speaking of like ayahuasca and things like this, how this is sort of the, uh, evolving and moving across the world and a lighting up in consciousness throughout communities and and cultures that never would have i mean not from the amazon yet there it that plant consciousness is starting to merge and uh, migrate and work out throughout throughout the world so like that concept in itself of like you know we can whether a plant intelligence and consciousness you and i you know we can uh have a conversation about that but that may sound a little strange for other people but if you take in the concept of that, like this long term sort of symbiosis that's sort of happening with with this, there's many different avenues, but with this this modality in particular, then you're having this deep psychological sort of cleanse and, and interaction with another intelligence that can help to re reflect that lens back on the self and on the on cultures that maybe were never in touch with this sort of thing. And that in itself, like propels that whole healing journey and now it doesn't have to be that extreme or that example i do feel like it's a slow progress though like everything kind of dealing with culture and society like it's on another level of time that takes more on un unfolding and you know the up to that individual pace through in those communities to then branch out and like you know the the whole reflective light of those lighting the candle of the heart and how that sort of spreads and also we're talking about now, like we have such an interconnected world where we do have all this influx of different mythologies, different perspectives, different religions and kind of all crisscrossing and the wisdoms from particular traditions that are, are migrating to other traditions and vice versa. And I feel like that all in itself kind of involves and, per and perpetuates that whole healing journey. So, yeah, that makes sense. It does make sense. And I'm reminded that even though turning on the news, mm. what you experience can seem really negative. I read an article a few years back that was pointing out that by many metrics, even if we don't realize it, you know, the world is a much better place yeah. than it was 100 years ago, 200 years ago, 500 years ago. More people have access to nutrition. There is less war. People live longer, more babies survive. I mean, many of these basic public health indices are actually a dramatic improvement, at least before yeah. the pandemic. That probably puts a wrinkle in some of the things. But we don't talk about those things every day. What we right. see every day is you know, what the news media chooses as the most dramatic crisis of the day mm -hmm. so that more people will watch the media, no matter what kind of media you prefer to watch, uh, right. and keep us glued to the 
the froth, the noise at the top of the scale so that we are all agitated and kept reactive. So it's a conundrum between is the world really going to hell in a handbasket or is it actually getting slowly better? We just haven't opened our eyes to the good that is happening all around us. Mm -hmm. We're still creating. It's like humans have this need to make more things more complicated than they actually are. <laughs> we seem to find a way to make it worse. And it's so true. I'm glad you brought Do you know, um, I'm just sure you know, David Byrne from Talking Heads. Uh, yes. Because we're burning down the house. We're burning down the house. Exactly. But he started for, for, for uh, precisely that reason, uh, reasons to be cheerful. And it's a media outlet that's only only agenda is to put out actually positive sort of like this is like the real healing stuff that's happening on the world whether it's culturally socially ecologically and it's all about the focus on how we are like improving on like and it's all positive sort of um research that's happening it's positive stories that are happening and it's just because you're absolutely right the media focus is on sensational drama that it's all about getting ratings and it's not a true sort of filter for actual reality itself. Like this is not happening all the time. And you know, yes, we're more aware of it. Like it's also, we like everyone has a, like a video phone that we can capture absolutely everything happening. So there's a little bit more, um, more awareness of what is actually kind of occurring, but we do need to kind of change our perspective on how we're actually viewing the world. Cause you're absolutely right. Like, you look on on paper, things are trending on a more. Unless you're looking at the climate, <laughs> the, the, the climate crisis. I'll pass it back to you. My dog brought me a ball, so in her world everything is fine, from her doggy perspective. If I throw this ball for her, <laughs> <laughs> but that comes back to perspective. Perspective. Yeah. And I mean, I know from my own personal life that perspective makes all the difference. I mean, all the emotions are there all the time. Right. We have some choice as to how we judge a situation. If we judge it as useful or happy or desirable, we're going to be experiencing a flood of positive emotions and endorphins. If we judge the situation as negative or undesirable, we're going to be experiencing a flood of uh, less pleasant emotions. Because let's face it, the biochemistry of excitement and anxiety is not that far apart. It's just no. the label that we give it. But again, that is for one human being. Now, one human being can make that kind of choice. Where do I want to put my attention? But what happens when it's a collective? And thanks to technology, our collective our collective mind space otherwise known as the internet for lack of a better term is now developing technologies to mirror back to us what it thinks we want and so if our outlook is scary negative fear-based cue-ish then that's what we're going to get more of. Whereas if our, if our outlook is more looking for the good news, the positive side of things, we're going to get, or even shoes, we're going to get more of that <laughs> because it's tracking what we do already and amplifying it. So when that's the case, how do we form a consensus mm -hmm. when the walls of individual reality bubbles are being reinforced with concrete. Like, I know my way is true because I saw it on television and then all of my friends started talking about it and then it's in all of our news feeds, so it must be true. When mm -hmm. someone else has a totally different mediated experience. Yeah. Where do you begin to have the dialogue to see things differently. Ordinarily, I would think, 
you know, my shadow, I project my shadow onto you, you project your shadow onto me. But if we're in close contact with each other, we're going to have to deal with that. (laughs) We're going to have to deal with that on an immediate way. And if we were neighbors, we would still have to deal with that. Even if we were living in different parts of the city, we would have some common square that we could work out some of those issues. Where is that common place that we stand today? If it's not the media because it has a different agenda, if it's not the government because it has a different agenda, where do you go? Or do you go within? Is this something that's happening on, you know, some etheric astral level where we're all having a a conversation of which most people are not conscious because it's in shadow? Right. Right. Wow. (laughs) A lot of questions there. (laughs) I have lots of questions, few answers. Yeah, it's really true because it it also because so many of it, it, so much of it, excuse me, is like a chicken and the egg situation but i do feel um like you said like this collective conversation is sort of happening in this kind of psychic field of out of sort of knowing and i feel like that's exactly why we're you know here right here right now is like we're constantly in this grand healing dance it's already happening it's already over in a grand scheme of things you know it's already happened we're already there but we're also just kind of progressing through it but it's tough because you're you're absolutely right. Like we don't have a forum for those things, and we're also not taught to look at these things at, at an early age, unless it's on an individual basis. And it was something I was thinking about on a walk I had maybe last night or some night. I think about it often, <laughs> so it doesn't really matter <laughs> when. <laughs> Is that like you know? Obviously, you know, I could speak for for the states um, and how you know things that I would like to see in the education system like early on is like two things well three things let's say uh the, the third is just popped in is like emotional intelligence like let's legitimize this as a conversation like that's a, yeah uh but other, the other one is media literacy and cultural re- relativity so if you don't have cultural relativity or teaching cultural relativity or media literacy then you're not gonna have to i don't know like that i feel like needs to be instilled pretty early on to, to real, realize that you know our way is not the only way you know our family's ways isn't aren't, aren't the only way you know there's a this wide uh group of of perspective that is there and like you know like the your kids you want that big box of crayola crayons that has like all the colors and all the you know it's more fun to draw that way and you know i feel like we're we have that sense inherently, but then it, it calcifies, you know, as you're going through society and going through that, the whole cultural institutions and things like that. Um, but then like media literacy, we're like, I mean, I don't think I really encountered that until college. So like if I didn't have that sort of perspective and that sort of teaching that was kind of brought to me at that point, then would I have been a more rigid personality and perspective? I mean, that's also then are you uh, nature versus nurture and the product of your environments and things like that. I don't think I would have changed that much, but I do feel like it's a valuable sort of pattern recognition to understand that where the sources are coming from, why this information is coming out at, you know, this time and place. Um, But then also to understand that, you know, there's a wide range of cultural variants that has to be in consideration, whether it's environmental, whether it's based on, you know, um, and it's all these factors and they have to be considered when you're looking at something. And I feel like that's all part of understanding that collective shadow is that, you know, there, we're not all on the same evolutionary trajectory and journey. We're not in the same timeline and where we're working in orchestration. So like there's discordant and, and harmonic notes happening and everything sort of synthesizes and comes together when you look at it like in the whole when we start picking apart and looking at little bits and pieces it's like oh this isn't right and that's not right because it should be this way that way but it all has its sort of place and its timing and comes together in some sort of way i think hopefully <laughs> that's what it comes down to isn't hope it's hopefully yeah. you know i i like to believe i want to believe that we all have the free will to make choices about these things. Mm. Everyone has the free will to expand their own reality bubble. 
But I also have to recognize that not everybody believes that their reality bubble needs expanding. (laughs) That's true. And the reason they often don't believe their reality bubble needs expanding is because they've never encountered something that challenged the way their reality is. And it goes back to studies that say, you know, people who ex- who have the um, most narrow belief systems are often the ones who experience the least amount of diversity in their in their immediate environments. So if you come from a place where there are people from all different cultures and religions interacting, you're probably going to have a more tolerant worldview than if you come from a place where everyone is homogenized, that they have the same background, they have the same religion, they have the same tradition or something. It's not always the case. I mean, obviously, individual temperament comes in, but it's generally the case. And I often wonder how my brother and I got so um, left of family center (laughs) 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 compared to my own parents who... uh, grew up in a much more traditional environment than either one of us did. I, I, precocious as I was, actually went to an international boarding school when I was 16 years old. So I had classmates from 70 different countries, and we barely spoke the same language, let alone um, have the same backgrounds. And so, you know, when, when you are exposed to that many points of view at such a young age, it's really hard to believe any of them gets preference over any other. And that started the process for me. So I know that's just an amazing experience. So to cut you off. That's awesome. It was truly amazing. And I got to be in the forest of Endor. <laughs> the Ewoks lived just outside of my school. And so we got to go running where the those forest flying bikes things. The speeder I think it was the speeder bikes. Speeder bikes, yeah. I think so. I may we have got to run name. along the same paths as the speeder bikes. And that is bikes. fantastic. Anyway, so where was I? Redwood Forest, right? Yeah, um, in the Redwood Forest, to the Gulf Stream waters, back to Texas. Yeah, you and your brother, and they're, yeah. My brother, of course, followed in my footsteps because if my older sister did it, then I will go to Europe and go study there. So he also got out and became a, got his, his PhD in international relations. So we got out because of some temperament, but other just circumstance. One thing led to another. I lucked into finding a school and applying and getting in and getting sent across the country because my family could afford to do it. What about people who who don't have that kind of experience? Right. You know, you, you can't blame people. You can't say everyone's going to have, I mean, everyone may have the possibility to expand their worldview, but does everybody have the, the lever or the place to stand in order to do it right. or even realize they need to or want to? And that's a really hard thing to accept that it's there is a fate aspect with this and hey how do you save the world when the world doesn't want to be saved or doesn't even recognize it needs to be saved or maybe i'm wrong and it actually doesn't need to be saved at all because it's all going exactly where it needs to go it just hasn't all been revealed yet or is that just a is that just a cop out for going back to my my little three-dimensional world and going back to my computer and doing my own little work and <laughs> because it all seems so big and overwhelming. Yeah. Inquiring wise want to know the answers to all of these things. <laughs> well, let me tell you. <laughs> yeah, no, I think about those questions quite a bit uh, as well. And I feel like it's like, it's like a little, little bit of awe in that, in that situation. Like, you know, more and more, I feel like, and it's not like in a selfish term, selfish term, excuse me, like the same thing with self-care. I think we talked about it a while ago. It's not being selfish if you're kind of tending your own garden. And I feel like at this, like that is really the realm that the only thing we can actually even make choices or even try to improve our lives comes from the stuff, the work we do in ourselves and how we interact in our local community and the, on that daily basis, that daily level. And like those small little micro reactions and choices sort of have that rippling effect and but then I also have that more bird's eye view where I do feel like, yeah, even like everything does kind of and ultimately is sort of OK <laughs> in a sense. Like I feel like that it's headed in the right direction, the right direction, whatever that direction is. 
Because, I mean, ultimately, what, we're kind of, our sun's already in, we're ensnared in that event horizon. We're already <laughs> speeding towards that black hole. We're already devoured. So, like, sit back and enjoy the, enjoy the ride a little bit. <laughs> well, let's hope that at least the black hole issue is not happening for another couple billion years because that's, like, totally outside my pay grade. Um, <laughs> Unless we're already in it, and then we're just swirling around. Just you know, this, this is all reality is. We're just seeing the light show caught in that. It's fun to think about. <laughs> all these things are fun and terrifying to think about at the same time. So, if all we can truly control is ourselves and our own reactions, in the micro not, choices that we get, you know, on some level, what we do is holding space. Yeah. Every yeah. little bit of light that we can manage to hold on to in ourselves and shine throughout our lives, holds space for the possibility for that light to be shared with others. You know, even if it's in a class that I make or a podcast that we talk on or a conversation that has had, you know, with the wonderful person loading the groceries into the back of my trunk. Um, any of those things are small moments that can help change the whole. And maybe someone who has a little louder megaphone could perhaps do more, more good, we hope. But what does it come down to more than trust that things are unfolding the way they need to, even if it doesn't look like that? Yeah, yeah, exactly. Trust and holding space. Love how you said holding space, because that's the perspective I hold dear myself like i feel like that's all we can do even you know even holding space for ourselves for our more difficult moments you know um but it's important like because we really never know what people are going through we don't really know their perspective at all like all in some of these random encounters all we're seeing is very much a, a brief snapshot of a human being and when we encounter like someone has road like you know we're getting you know the horn honk honked at us or someone's just in a moment of agitation you know and that gets passed on to us are we really going to like judge the totality of someone's being just by that 20 second interaction and i think we do because we hold like in that weight that moment it's such an intense encounter and it's hard to think about because then our, we get wounded, our egos get flare up, and then it's hard not to just react and reflect backwards. But if we can kind of sort of sit with that, realize that, okay, this is just a glimpse of an entire being of you know, someone's life. Like, do what, what do we really know about that? So we can kind of like bear witness and, and hold space and do do the best for ourselves in that moment that could be like i'm not going to get angry at this because why would you want to be flooded and with that sort of toxic I'm not saying anger there's not a positive for anger either sorry sorry anger <laughs> stinks and anger get apology <laughs> for me later on <laughs> but you know what i mean like we're all we, all we see is that little little moment and it's hard to like to be patient with that does that make sense that totally makes sense I'm reminded of something else I've been thinking about lately, which is some writings. I think it was Thomas Jefferson around the time that they were writing the uh, Declaration of Independence, musing on the concept of building a tolerant society mm. and that tolerance is a valued commodity in a society as long as everyone is willing to recognize it as a shared value and that there is a marketplace so that bad ideas have the possibility of being shouted down so that the best ideas will prevail. But that in a society where there is no marketplace, no freedom of thought, no freedom, no first amendment rights, so to speak, where intolerance is allowed to flourish, the value of tolerance shifts a little bit because how do you tolerate the intolerant mm. especially when it threatens to destabilize the collective and i think that is one of the one of the things we're all faced with right now is how this is a moment this is a moment in our collective american psyche um, and i think it's hitting us a little more potently than it is many other places simply because 
well, from an astrological perspective, it's the United States that's having their Pluto return. <laughs> but we've just gotten to that place in our own culture and our own internal dialogue where we must deal with our own shadowed past. It's not a projection. It's a documented historical fact that the United States, really all of the Americas, were built on the dual genocide of yeah. killing off the native inhabitants of the Americas and slavery. That's just how we got here. It is part of yeah. who and what we are. And to bury that because it makes us feel bad is useless. But the legacy we still deal with even almost 500 years ago since this since the first Europeans arrived in this hemisphere. We can talk about that. We can both nod in agreement because we're both extremely educated people who've traveled around a lot. But there's so many people who can't even say that as a conversation because they, they feel it as a threat to their personal ego yeah. because they can't even distinguish between what happened in our ancestral past that still resonates for us today and what is happening right now. Right. So people get very defensive. And then you're thinking like you're attacking their, you know, their personal self. And then, you know, it's that whole reactive tendency that happened. But yeah, it's um, some heavy talk about heavy collector shadow that that's coming up because it's not even just on the fact that of the, the dual genocide. It's also on broken, broken treaties and stolen land and a, a, a ultimate lack of integrity. So you see that kind of coming up in the, in the light of, say, of the of um, the collective for the, the the government for society like that the lack of integrity is kind of coming to into question and we saw that in the last administration i'm not going to get into political i don't care who what people support but you there is this and also the media perpetuates it as well that these mixed and skewed storylines without with a kernel of truth and truth and just built on this this insubstantial mcdonald food you know, we, we kind of get distracted from that those kind of concepts. And I, I trailed off on, on a, a fl I'm imagining this fluffy little spaghetti monster built of <laughs> McDonald food and this little kernel of truth nugget flying around the sky. But that is totally coming up. And, you know, it's totally coming to a crux. And we're we, obviously we're going to be seeing more and more of that. But that lack of integrity, I think, is the cornerstone of of those of those problems because that's all we really ever have even though we're holding space for someone is that in, integral center for the self and whether it's the heart the consciousness whatever you want to want to say and that is that is the center point where all interaction and all avenues lead from so if that is tainted let's talk about like we're talking about shadow that heavy shadow needs to be sort of purges it becomes into that light of consciousness so then we can actually become aware of it and then do the work of integrating it and we're in that in that phase which is totally like an eclipse cycle right isn't that like one of the main things of eclipses donna i would think so i would hope so um, you know i think of integrity as that line of light that connects our our heart our center to the divine spark within each one of us. And that when you stand in that column of light, you are at least recognizing that you are connected to something bigger and deeper than yourself. Mm. And that spark of divinity in my reality bubble is everywhere. It's in everything. It's in all of us. It's in you and me and, and the rocks and the plants and my crazy dog with her ball and even the ball that she's carrying around. Mm -hmm. There's something there. There's something numinous about the entire, the entire felt creation. In my worldview, which makes the possibility of redemption of the whole mm -hmm. just a moment away. But that's my worldview. It, it's a where the divine is imminent and present yeah. all the time. But I recognize that another of our challenges is that, you know, there are various religions and belief systems mm. that feel the divine is way out 
there and we are terrible things down here and heap on the shame and the you know worms crawling around that we don't deserve that divine spark or that it doesn't exist and there's a novel by uh, Madeline Langle. Actually, it's a series of novels, The Wrinkle in Time and the two that followed it, A Wind in the Door and A Swift Tilting Planet. And they were all about a, just a battle going on in the heavens between the forces of light and the Ethroi. And the Ethroi were creatures of nothingness. Their sole job was to X out, to make the ultimate in cancel culture, I suppose. It's a matter. Nice. <laughs> to, the, to X out the value of life and to turn it into nothingness. And we look at that as a ultimate evil, an ultimate <clears throat> demonizing force. And yet one could argue that those who are most prone to demonization are actually taking on the role of the ethroi in the drama because they're the ones starting from the premise that, you know, we are worms. You know, there's only one true way to save us all. Otherwise, you're all going to hell in a handbasket. Right. And so we're in this very complicated moment where we're not even speaking the same language anymore. Mm -hmm. You know, one person's demons are another person's saviors. But if we don't see it and express it, how do we claim it and transcend it? So maybe we're all acting out different parts of this play for one another so that we can all learn from the experience. I mean, don't they talk about in new age circles that when you get caught in a relationship with someone that working out of karma is to be able to show each other your shadows because you both benefit from the experience from different points of view. Oh gosh. I feel like that is the only reason for relationships. <laughs> like, that's a, another healing journey at a whole nother level. It's insane what you can get, you can encounter and dig up in an intimate partnership. It's amazing. But I absolutely agree with you too. Like there is, see, I always see it as like everything is sort of the, the discordant and the, the dissonance and the resonance and everything's sort of harmonizing and sounding like a part, like individually it may not sound that great, but when you put all that, that everything together, you pan out and hear it all in orchestra. That's a, some beautiful cosmic sympathy symphony happening right now. And it's not always going to be like, happening simultaneously and in flux there's this this whole dance that's happening that's non-linear so it's at a time at a time and place and again it goes back to that individual interaction with, that we have with one another i think that is the most important thing that you can do because then we're speaking a common language like when you're having a one-on-one -on -one conversation with someone that is just it's speaking from the heart the two hearts are opening up it doesn't matter if you're strangers who've known someone for years that interaction is there and you can have like i feel like that is almost i don't know that it's very beneficial what an around and around episode we have been having which <laughs> suggests the of difficulty course. of dealing with shadow it is it is something to get your hands it's something difficult to get your hands around you have to sit and, and wait for it to emerge and it's a very lunar thing that way. You have to. And wait. And also, like, it's uh, it's a very serpentine symbol as well. The whole shedding of the skin and the whole waxing process of the moon. And and then the, the sh literal shedding of the skin like a snake and letting go of that light, everything that came to, that came to consciousness. And then going back into the dark and that dark moon phase. And which that's a potent, that's potent alchemy and it's uh it's a potent journey. But yeah, <laughs> there's too much to say on it. <laughs> where to begin, where to end. How do we sum up what we have learned in our hour of a podcast? Now, we have learned that Great question. from one point of view, it's all good. It's all good. Perhaps we can trust that there is a uh, collective human intelligence that as odd as it looks from the point of view of our mass mediated world is actually heading in the right direction yeah. and we will get there in the end and have a faith in that kind of process our part is to stay with our own integrity to shine a light in the world to be mindful and not overreact 
to be willing to claim our own stuff and work through it and hold space for others because perhaps just the intention to be in one's truth and act with integrity and compassion will have ripple effects that we can't understand yet. That even the difficult bits are just part of the unfolding of the story. Any, any, any good astrologer will tell you that because charts are always changing. We're always moving from one thing to another thing. And so, right. and everything, every part of the story leads to something else. And since we don't know what the something else is, we can't know. It's just like, look back at your own life. I'm sure if you're listening to me, bad things have happened in your life. Really terrible things. Really sometimes traumatic things. Oh, yeah. But a lot of times people, if you ask people, if you could do it all over again, would you avoid that? They will tell you no, because they'll say no, because it made me who I am today. And I'm okay with what I am. And so it wasn't pleasant while I was going through it, but it's made me stronger. And we could apply that logic to whatever is happening in the collective right now, that it's the opportunity to become stronger and grow from it. Post-traumatic growth, as they call it. Still, there's some part of me that's like, but, but isn't there something else I can do? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh-huh. It's because it's exhausting. Let's, let's be honest. The, the lessons are never, never done. <laughs> They're always there. You may get a like momentary respite, but it's, it's always there. And, um, yeah, and like in this whole, I feel like, and I always encounter that there's a lot of people that feel ultimately guilty. Like it's like it's similar to survivor's guilt when you are going through a good phase, like or you're having experienced a lot of happiness and joy, but then maybe some close loved ones aren't, or you know, um, a whole country is going through like like tremendous tragedy and there is so much suffering happening at the world at the same time but those are never like they're never completely in sync like so you do have to hold space even hold space to like i feel like to to embrace that joy to enjoy embrace that happiness if you're blessed to have that in your life that particular moment in time you know because it like those cycles move and they change and it's not always going to be the case so i feel like you're even holding up and holding space for shadow for suffering by embracing that joy and happiness in your life because it's because we're all just kind of was it ram das we're all just walking each other home and it's so true because not everyone's going to be we're not always on the same same page even though we go through these collective rhythms but then there's that individual note that's kind of coming through and so it's all that 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 harmonization that sort of happens and it's I don't know. I think that's when it gets, it can get like distracting and maybe defeating when you're thinking that like, oh, it's not either happening fast enough. And, but it's all that perspective, you know, time, distance and speed and space. And that's all relative. And yeah, when you're placing a gut judgment like that, it's not happening fast enough. I should be doing more. You know, <laughs> yeah. That's coming out of your shadow. Oh, yeah, yeah. That's just, that is your shadow speaking right there. That's my shadow speaking right there. Right. That somehow I'm not doing good enough. And and for some people that I'm not doing good enough just opens up a cascade of mm -hmm. issues, a cascade of shame that, that makes it, it's like piling on. <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. <laughs> don't pile on. There's another thing we just, don't pile on. We've got enough to deal with. Don't let your judgments make situations even more dire. You know, sometimes, sometimes I have the sneaking suspicion that the uh, postmodern age brought a lot of this to a head, because mm -hmm. I remember back in, in school, you know, postmodernism was all the rage. And if you're not familiar, if you didn't have to go to the same school I did, you know, the modernist movement was the idea that you know there is some objective truth that we can all know directly. A postmodernist doctrine came after that that basically said well it's not quite that simple because everyone has a perspective and everyone has a belief and we're all looking through our reality bubbles and so there's not one truth with a capital t that we all share we are all we are all much more richly textual nuanced and truth is always part of that context well hmm. 
if truth. truth doesn't exist, then you can say, well, how is my truth less valid than your truth? And from a postmodern perspective, you might say, well, it can't be because you can't possibly know. But there's always a little modernist in all of us that says, mm -hmm. yeah. But I'd like to believe that my truth, that the world is not flat and is older than 6,000 years, is better than your truth of that the world is flat and only 6,000 years old. Because at least I have the preponderance of the evidence <laughs> that can be measured and touched on my side in this conversation. But even that... So do you think that things that you can touch and see are real? <laughs> That's the only real thing, it. Even that, I can't 100% <laughs> prove that SpongeBob didn't make the Earth 10 days ago. See, there's that's actually the truth. We we you're hearing it first here, everyone. Spongebob it could have happened. Is the grand old creator in ten days, and he took no rest though. He just spread it out. He pays himself a little bit. Better He's a sponge. He can do he away. can do those kinds of things. Um, <laughs> I can't prove that one hundred percent, but that's a nuanced argument because it's so nuanced. I'm I'm not sure that our collective consciousness finds it a useful one yet i mean there there really is uh, no true objectivity but yeah i mean then then we look like uh you know we're just obviously we have to see everything and speak of everything as the human lens since we are humans <laughs> you and i don't know as far as i know <laughs> so we can always speak from that human perspective are you sure but that uh, who knows I mean, sure? no no i'm not sure i am not sure <laughs> I could be from the planet. Oh, I can't come up with a good name off the top of my head. Ah, oh, dang it! I, dang it's it! Real. It's would have been funnier if I had. Because <laughs> you're thinking about all the thousands of fixed stars you know in your head right now, and you can't come up with one. It's hilarious. I love when that happens. What was I talking about? I don't know. I don't know what we're talking about this entire episode. <laughs> <laughs> I know it's about time to be over, and I'm still trying to sum it up. And oh, the perspective of objectivity. Oh, and not humans not being the only sentient species or the only perspective of consciousness, what have you. Yeah, because then you know you have the whole planet con uh, plant consciousness, and then the Gaia consciousness, and that whole collective thing, and then the solar system consciousness, and then the Milky Way consciousness, and then the universal consciousness. A lot of consciousness. It's exhausting. Wheels within wheels. Okay, so what I've learned is that. For my next life, I'm going to volunteer to come back for the planet of the elves, and we will let the earthlings do their thing, and I can watch from afar, because I will always have a soft spot for this beautiful little planet, despite its crazy ways. How's that? It's is that, is that a learning? Like, that is a, that's a learning, but you're also like doing that right now, too, because you're know, nonlinear. <laughs> like... I've been like big on that. Everyone's probably thinking I'm just crazy. It's like it's like he's alive and dead at the same time. What is happening? I'm like, yeah, well, it's not linear, people. <laughs> it's not only alive and dead, it's it's existing and not existing at the same time. Not Wrap your brain exactly. about that. We're already living five thousand car incarnations at once and then dealing with having to do my taxes in year twenty twenty one. It's ridiculous. But it you think about it, it's like ultimately ridiculous the little mundane things that we actually have to do to just do what we have to do to get by in life. It's pretty funny. Talk about a, talk about a shadow there. Yeah. <laughs> I must say, I did you warn you. It was an interesting, wandering episode, but hopefully with lots of food for thought. And now it's time for an experiment. Now, experiments on shadow work, it's a little bit difficult to come up with something that's going to take a minute or two because by definition a shadow is a part of yourself that you push away and you don't want to see so doing shadow work takes some time you need to make some space in your life for that quiet still voice to emerge and to do some self observation so it's a great thing to get started with this week if you don't already keep a journal if you're not already making space in your life to tend to your shadow, then it's a great time to get started. And if you need a little help along the way, I've created a special Book of Shadows training to help you 
develop a tool, work with your shadow on a day-to-day -day basis. You can find out more about it at magicandmastery.com slash book. We'll tell you all about the program. It includes several hours of audio and video training, as well as an outline to set you up on a journaling practice that you can use every day to help you bring some more balance to your life. Once again, thank you all for listening to our podcast. Before you go, don't forget to check out the show notes at www.magicandmastery.com slash podcast because we've included timestamps and links to all the books and other things that we talk about during this episode to make it easy to find just the things that you are looking for. Thanks for tuning in to this episode of Magic and Mastery with us, your host, Donna Woodwell and Chris Kaplan. Of course, we love getting feedback. It helps us figure out what you love so we can provide more of the good stuff. So it would mean so much to us if you just take a moment to rate and review the podcast. And if you like it, why don't you share it with a friend? <laughs>